This is Caught in the Act with Tim Clark. Welcome back. This is a true story. So begins the complex, confronting, darkly tragicomic story of Richard Gadd, the struggling Scottish comedian who became a baby reindeer in the eyes of his stalker. She comes to my work, my house. She sends me emails, like, all the time. Really manly hands, haven't you? Chiseled jawline. Should we run away together? That nuanced tale of obsession has taken the entertainment world by storm, prompted a woman to come forward to claim she was Martha, but not a stalker. I find it quite obscene, I find it horrifying, misogynistic. And also prompted argument about what really is a true story, with the creator himself saying that what he put on the screen and into millions of homes was emotionally 100% true. Well, the case caught in the act we'll cover this week is a true story. One that played out and was then laid out in consummate detail by a Perth magistrate last week and this. And also one which had eerie echoes of Richard Gadd, his Martha and baby reindeer. Like Martha, Kobe Jane Langshaw had a background in the law. Like Martha, Ms. Langshaw presented as affable, intelligent, attractive and professional. And also, like Martha, her obsessions, compulsions and delusions have ravaged lives and led to a stalker being slowly but surely exposed. Joining me this week to discuss the case of the state of Western Australia versus Kobe Jane Langshaw and how her behaviours reflect a proliferating problem is clinical and forensic psychologist Professor Troy McEwen from Swinbourne University of Technology. Thanks so much for joining us today, Professor. No worries. Thanks for having me. So before I descend into the details of this case, give us your definition as an expert in the field of of what is a stalker or a stalking case? Well, look, you're not the only person to ask that question. It's a a difficult and technical one that's Mm. been been hard to to work through. Mm. Stalking is basically a pattern of behaviour, right? So when a stalking case is happening, someone is engaging in a pattern of repeated and unwanted behaviour that has no legitimate reason Mm. and causes the person or people they're targeting to be distressed or fearful um, that something something worse might happen. And it's that word unwanted that really sticks out to me because i mean you 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 can you can court someone still maybe in this in in this day and age and and that behavior you know repeated phone calls messaging sort of gifts if it's uh, reciprocated then that's not a problem but it's the unwanted nature that then goes on to cause intimidation fear um you know stress that 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 yeah. really sets those cases apart that's exactly right. And I often actually, when I'm training police or, or other people in kind of recognising stalking, often I give exactly that example, right? So if you're, you know, getting phone calls and someone's delivering flowers to your workplace and maybe you see them, you know, in the street and you want that, you're probably dating them. Mm. If you don't want that and it's making you distressed, they're stalking you. Yeah, so it's literally the, in, the perception of the victim and the impact on the victim that defines when stalking is present, which is part of the reason it's so difficult mm. um, to recognise and also to prosecute. Yeah. And that recognition is, as you say, by the victim. And from this case and from others that I've read about since watching Baby Ranger, the recognition doesn't really um, register on the other side by the person that's that's doing the, the pursuing. No, that's right. And so... When you talk to people who have stalked, um, it's very common that that person doesn't consider their behaviour to mm. be problematic or to be stalking. Um, sometimes people do, and that's that's you know it's good. Sometimes people recognise that, but quite often the person who who has stalked or is stalking actually feels like they're perhaps the target or the victim of an unwarranted kind of persecution because they've been, you know, arrested or, or sent to court and they, they don't feel that what they're doing is, is wrong. So 
in our true story, in late 2015, Kobe Jane Langshaw was going through some stuff. Social media posts had previously shown her happily married, a mother, Christmas, birthdays, sunlit pictures with her kids. She also had connections in Perth's legal fraternity. She had worked in several city law firms as a clerk. She regularly commented online about her career, legal talking points, successes that firms and apparent friends in the industry were having. But also at this point in her life, she needed a lawyer of her own which is how she came into the orbit of Patrick Gardner. He had been a solicitor in Perth for three years, having worked in courts and for legal offices for years before that. He specialised in family law matters, but also represented a criminal or two. By 2016, he was representing to a court that he needed a restraining order for himself which prevented Ms Langshaw from coming anywhere near his home or his work. Despite that court order, which eventually specified Langshaw must keep a distance of two kilometres between her and Mr Gardner, she could not or would not stay away. In September 2016, Mr Gardner's CCTV cameras at home captured her with two of her children just 10 metres from his boundary fence. In October 2016, the president of the football club Mr Gardner played for was contacted by Langshaw, who was masquerading as an AFL official. She then attended the club's awards night and declined to leave when asked. In March 2017, Langshaw was seen in the laneway behind Mr Gardner's again, up to twice a week, on top of repeated attempts at contact via social media. In an extraordinary concession, the registrar of WA's family court wrote to her saying she was not permitted to enter that building because of her behaviour inside. Weeks later, Langshaw sat on a bench within 100 metres of that court and filmed an unsuspecting Mr Gardner as he walked past. When police investigated and attended Langshaw's home, she said, he was threatening me. Professor, I've, I've... heard and watched you say in other forums stalking is really sort of an umbrella term for all manner of behaviors which can range from you know phone calls to physical acts of harm but it would seem sort of in this case as in others these behaviors are your classic persistent unrelenting unwanted attentions yeah stalking essentially that's that's the defining feature regardless of how someone does it it is about pushing yourself into the victim's life, imposing yourself where you're not wanted. And obviously people will use all sorts of strategies to do that. And certainly people I've worked with have done all sorts of kind of different things. Um, But yeah, the most common um, stalking behaviours are things like telephone calls, um, emails, you know, communicating directly with someone via their social media. And then you also have, you know, kind of more indirect behaviours like posting things online to damage someone's reputation, you know, loitering near their house or where they work, um, and in a, a minority of cases, but, you know, too many, um, physical violence. So physical violence is, depending on what kind of sample you ask, somewhere between about 20 and probably 30% of stalking cases involve some physical violence. Um, threatened violence is much more common. Mm. So upwards of 50%, 60% of people are threatened by the person stalking them. Mm. And... Sort of in your experience and in your research, what have you found psychologically it is that drives a person to sort of refuse to back down or let go, you know, (laughs) even when they're, you know, threatened with arrest and charge and, you know, possibly Mm. prison? Yeah, look, it's really difficult to nail it down to kind of one thing, Mm. right? So what you see commonly amongst people who stalk is that they're very intensely emotional about the situation Mm -hmm. that in which they are stalking so they feel very strongly about that situation and about the victim and about the victim's role in that situation and those really intense emotions don't subside so if you think kind of you know everyone has situations where they feel very strongly that's really normal but for most people those emotions will gradually over time, you know, reduce or you'll find ways to think about them and to express them that help you to gradually kind of feel better about them or or return to a more normal emotional state. It seems like for people who stalk, 
that doesn't happen in the same way. So they get kind of stuck, if you like, in mm. this loop mm. where they are in this situation, they feel incredibly strongly about it. And then they, instead of choosing or trying to change their emotions, you know, by, you know, talking to their friends or, you know, going for a run or whatever it is, you know, smelling a nice candle, whatever it is, <laughs> they, um, they see the situation or their emotions as being because of the other person. And so then they'll do things to communicate with or target the person, i.e. the stalking victim, to try and change the situation and therefore change their emotional state. And then that in itself isn't stalking. If that happens once, well, that that's okay. But then the problem is they kind of get stuck. And so they do something and then their emotions don't change or, or they change for a bit, but they come back. So then they have to respond again. And they, so they keep kind of going around. And mm. I've had a, a colleague... <laughs> use it to kind of describe that it's a bit like a ferris wheel right they kind of get on at the bottom and they go around and most people get off again when they get around once the people who stalk they get on the ferris wheel and they just kind of get stuck and they keep missing the exit because the emotions just stay there and they're in this loop and they keep responding and behaving and once they've done that a few times and the kinds of behaviors they're using are causing that distress or fear what they're doing is actually a stalking episode mm. by 2018 Mr. Gardner's restraining orders were still in place, not to come within 200 metres of his home or his work. That work was at a solicitor's office on Adelaide Terrace in the Perth CBD. In May of that year, Kobe Jane Langshaw signed a lease to live in an apartment around 200 metres from her new front door to his office door. Days later, she bumped into him as she went to take out her rubbish. Then, the following year, another arrest, another charge, another conviction after another sighting meters from Mr Gardner's door. Which leads us to the latest set of allegations, which first went to trial in 2022 and which eventually concluded last week. Not only was Ms Langshaw accused of aggravated stalking of Mr Gardner, but also of another man called Aaron Herbert, who also worked within the justice system. And after hearing weeks of evidence about numerous alleged breaches of VROs, Magistrate Belinda Coleman had some things to say about Mr Gardner. A very impressive witness who struck me as resigned and stoic. A very honest witness who had no motive to lie. About Mr Herbert. Frustrated and irritated by the behaviour of Ms Langshaw, but nevertheless gave truthful, accurate and reliable evidence. He also had no motive to lie. And about Ms Langshaw. She is a highly intelligent woman and she is skilled at lying to take advantage of others. It is clear that she uses charm to manipulate others for personal gain. She holds a sense of superiority and is very opinionated. When challenged, she becomes hostile, but can instantly switch back to being sweet and unassuming. She's accused police of being pro-charge, and she consistently berated them for not doing their job properly. It's clear that she was, and still is, completely infatuated by Mr Gardner. It was also clear to me from the outset of the trial that Ms Langshaw detests Mr Herbert, an intense dislike that borders on pathological. Professor, how usual it is for these type of offenders to have more than one fixation or target for their sort of victimisation? Look, in my experience, having multiple unconnected stalking victims is not that common. Mm. It happens, and I've certainly worked with people and, and dealt with cases where it happens what's more common in my experience is that there is a central victim a primary victim and then the person will also target other related people other secondary victims because of that person their relationship with the primary victim so a really classic example of this is someone who is stalking their ex-partner and the ex-partner starts a new relationship gets a new boyfriend new girlfriend and the person stalking starts to target that new boyfriend or girlfriend mm. because they're trying to kind of push them out and get them out of the situation so they can resume the relationship with their ex. So that kind of secondary victim is really, really very common um, and 
very frequently there's multiple secondary victims in a, in a stalking case. Mm. And obviously this case and others show that this type of behaviour does not always occur, uh, you know, in a family or domestic type scenario, although, you know, obviously many of the cases um, do stem from um, intimate relationships and particularly when they break down. Yeah, that's right. And when we look at stalking cases on the whole, a bit under half of cases are following the end of a, a relationship of some sort, mostly intimate relationships, but also, you know, estranged family members or estranged friends can be can be stalkers. Um, the other, you know, maybe a bit over 50% um, are a combination of people who are known to each other. So they might have been workmates or, you know, they knew each other through some social kind of, you know, hobby or something like that. Um, or they might, you know, in some cases, it's things like a doctor and a, a client, that kind of thing. Mm. So the, they know each other, they're acquaintances, and the stalking emerges in that context. And then in a smaller number of cases, maybe 20% of cases, they're complete strangers when the stalking begins. And so the person who starts stalking somehow comes upon that victim, you know, in their life. And for some reason, they they become kind of fixed on that person, uh, either because they they love them and they, they develop a kind of a, a sense that they are, they love them or are in a loving relationship, or equally common, for some reason that victim kind of becomes a target of you know the, the stalker's ire, like mm. they get angry with them and they're targeting the victim because they think the victim's doing something to them. Mm. And the imagined intimate relationship, um, mm. I mean, how how common is how common is that in these cases? It's <laughs> it's not the majority of cases. No. Um, it's but it's a very very identifiable. Uh, subtype of stalking. Mm-hmm. So in my profession, we'd usually call that group, um, there's either intimacy seeking, so they, they, they are seeking an intimate relationship of some sort, whether that's romantic or perhaps a familial relationship. Uh, and they're a, a reasonably sizable group. And then there's also people who are trying to just kind of just get a date. They're just a bit bad at it, <laughs> you know? And so when they try and get a date, they cause fear and they cause distress because they persist longer than they should. Mm. So they're a um, very common group, but mostly that group doesn't attract criminal justice attention because they don't persist in the same way and they're not that often threatening and and harmful. They can be, but not as often. So they won't usually come to police attention. These are the people that every woman has come across Hmm. um, who are just a little bit too intrusive. And most of the time that doesn't cause fear and distress, but when it does cross that line, um, that's when they they start stalking. Hmm. Over 15 days of evidence in 2022 and then 2024, the latest thick file of alleged breaches, invasions of privacy, unwanted contacts and ascending levels of weird displayed by Ms Langshaw were intimately detailed. That culminated, the court heard, in her moving house again, this time to the suburb of Caversham, where both the men who had sought protection from the courts lived Magistrate Coleman also concluded that Ms Langshaw's application to vary bail so to allow her work in the city and in the city's legal district was actually an attempt not to advance her career, but to give her access to her two victims. When they drove to work, when they went for coffee, when they went to the shops, she was there. There are no such things as chance meetings when it comes to Ms Langshaw, the magistrate said. She has an uncanny ability to find out information and be in places at opportune times. Those times included at least twice when her black Suzuki Swift swooped into the rear view mirrors of both men as they drove. And that was part of a campaign to deliberately cause them mental harm or at least apprehension was what Magistrate Coleman eventually concluded. Professor, facts like these ones, which are facts and stories like baby reindeer, they seem sort of completely out of the realms of reality. But the actual reality is that in Australia, in one year, there could be up to 400,000 recognised cases of stalking. Yeah, that's right. Um And... that is an incredible well, figure. That, uh, that, that, just, <laughs> that, that really did shock me when I read that this week. Yeah. It, I think people don't realise how common stalking is. People kind of, um, yeah, I think they just don't realise. We've got to be realistic. Say most stalking cases, so most episodes of stalking, will persist for weeks 
or a few months of mm-hmm. the outside. All right. Only about maybe 5% of cases go for longer than a year. Yeah, so it's quite uncommon for stalking to really persist out beyond a year. But once you do get out past a year, realistically, those cases don't stop without intervention. And even some of the, the, the you know, cases that go on for more than six months, you know, there needs to be some intervention because in those cases, it's, it's very likely that the stalking is being sustained by the presence of a mental illness Mm -hmm. um, on the part of the person who's stalking. So in my kind of research and and also my practice experience, if I have a case come across my desk where there's been stalking for over six months, I'll be starting to think, okay, does this person have a significant mental, mental illness that's related to the stalking? If it's gone for more than a year, I'm really probably looking at someone who's got an actual delusion about the victim. So they have a a psychotic um, symptom that about the victim and they believe that they have a connection with the victim that is factually not there. Mm -hmm. And that's actually what's driving the stalking. Or alternatively, it's also quite common in those very extended stalking cases that you see people who've got very severe personality disorders, which is kind of a chronic and enduring um, deficits in the way they interact with others and that kind of is all caught up in the stalking behaviour. And statistically, it suggests that this is, um, that those type of behaviours are, you know, male dominant, you know, most of the people mm. that, that, that do them are yep. male, but then, but it's obviously not always and, and, and no. men sort of make up quite a, a decent slice of, of the sort of the victims yeah. that we know of. Yeah, so stalking is a gendered behaviour. So, and what I mean by that is that most victims are women and most perpetrators are men, right? Um, in the general population out there, it's probably about 70% female victims, 30% male victims. Mm-hmm. That's a bit of an estimate, but that's kind of a bit of a generalisation. But about 70 30. When you look at the specific group who are stalking ex partners, that's quite different. That's up around 80 to 90% of victims are women and only 10 to 15% of perpetrators are men. Oh, sorry, 10 to 15% of victims are men. Mm-hmm. So the gendered nature of stalking is exacerbated in the cases that it might be related to family violence. Okay. If we look at cases that aren't ex partners, so all the other stalking cases, it's a bit more gender equal. So you get more female stalkers and more male victims in those cases. It's still not equal. It's still mostly female victims, but it's it's a bit bit less kind of extreme uh, in that group. The gender kind of disparity has all sorts of reasons. Um, One thing I want to be very clear about, though, is that regardless of the gender of the victim and the perpetrator, um, there's good evidence that stalking is extraordinarily damaging for all victims. Mm. Um, and actually things like physical violence in stalking cases are actually not that dissimilar, depend- regardless of whether your stalker is male or female. So women who stalk uh, are nearly as often violent as men. So I think some of the assumptions people might have about stalking and gender you know, really aren't borne out by the data that we know. Mm. Unfortunately, we also know that men who are stalked do get a an even worse response from from you know kind of police and other agencies um than women who are stalked so generally we see that stalking you know there's a poor response to stalking um it's it's poorly recognized it's often not dealt with as seriously as it should be these kind of things Mm. and that's true across the board but when you have a male victim and a female stalker that's actually exacerbated because people kind of for some reason often don't think that the victim should be um, as worried as they are, yeah. Um, yeah. And the, also, the statistics about the amount of act, these actual behaviours going on compared mm. to those which end up in court are also mm. quite shocking. Can you can you talk us through that? Yeah, sure. So look, we know as you as you pointed out before, you're in any one year there's you know something like four hundred thousand stalking cases uh, in Australia. So the Of the cases that happen, so that that number that you cited, I think, comes from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Mm -hmm. Um, So they occasionally do a big survey where they call a whole bunch of people and they ask them about victimisation experiences. And one of the things they ask about is stalking. In that same survey, they also ask how many people reported it to the police. So they experienced this thing. Did you go to the police with this? And so we know that 
you know, it's somewhere around, I think it's about 30%. I might have that number wrong, but I think it's about 30% of people in Australia who recognise that they're being stalked report that to the police. Okay. Then that reduces again. So in a lot of cases where people report stalking to the police, it doesn't necessarily immediately result in any charges. So that that's true of everything. Mm-hmm. Every time people report to police, it's not necessarily a charge. But in stalking cases, that's particularly true. So often there hasn't the, the police don't recognise that the pattern of conduct is actually a crime unless it involves like an explicit threat or maybe physical violence. So if you're just if you're just reporting, you know, a hundred phone calls, the police officer you report to may not recognise that that's actually something that would count as a crime. They just don't connect that with stalking. Mm. Yeah, and there's evidence. There's research showing this. This isn't just my opinion. There's there's good evidence of this internationally. Um, and so you have to kind of like leap through all these hurdles. So you, you have to, the victim has to say, this is serious enough to go to the police. And, and I think it's something that I could report to the police. So that first hurdle, then they go to the police and the police officer you get behind the desk on the day has to recognize that what you're telling them is stalking. And then they have to, um, put a charge in place and then their boss or their manager has to think, oh yeah, we, this is stalking too. They have to recognize it's stalking. And they have to think they could prove the charge. And then the police prosecutor has to recognise that it's stalking Mm. and they have to think they can prove the charge and not, like, make it less serious. Like, quite often what happens is that instead of charging with stalking, they'll charge with breaching the restraining order. So you never actually get a stalking charge. You just get hundreds of breaches of restraining order, Mm -hmm. right, which is a much less serious offence and inevitably means the person doesn't get a response that means they might be assessed and perhaps treated, for example, if there's a mental illness or something like that. Mm. And then the magistrate has to recognise that they're stalking and then they have to give a sentence that lets the corrections agency see that they're stalking. So there's just this, this inevitable, you know, winnowing away every single step from all these people who are being stalked down to the criminal justice kind of end of it, where in Victoria in any one year, I think there's about kind of roughly 2,000, maybe a little bit more stalking cases, you know, out of what is undoubtedly, you know, many hundred thousand mm. cases that are actually happening in the community. There's only about 2,000 to two to 3,000 that end up in a court recognised as stalking. Mm. And you've also, also talked previously about why it is really important that stalking is, is not only recognised but labelled as such, whether it be in in a court of law or, you know, yeah. in, in society in general, that the, yeah. these behaviours, the repeated phone calls, they're not just breaches. It is an actual, you know, recognised behaviour and it should be called out as such. That's exactly right. I mean, if we don't call these things stalking, essentially the behaviour vanishes. It vanishes in community discussion. So instead of saying that, you know, um, there's all these cases of stalking uh, about, you know, ex-partners or something, we end up just talking about the idea that, oh, this person made lots of phone calls. Mm. And there's not kind of a, the severity of it isn't recognised. Mm-hmm. And you see it all the time. You know, we see, you know, there's, there's cases in the media right now um, you know, there's some AFL footballers, for example, yep. who were being um, identified as, as engaging in, in problematic behaviour. And in those cases, the word stalking is not being used in the media. Mm. But it's very clearly, you know, it's very clearly when you when you look at it, it looks like stalking. Mm. Um, and there's lots of sensitivities for the media around that. And there's all sorts of complicated things about lawyers getting involved. Mm. But if we fail to call it, call it stalking, Essentially, people don't understand what stalking is, and so then they don't use the word, and then when they report it to police, the police don't recognise it, and it just has this compounding effect. Mm. Um, and it also means that it doesn't get the resources that are needed to respond better. Mm. You know, they, we don't have, for example, there's not support advocacy services for stalking victims in Australia. There is in other countries mm. because they've made concerted effort to use the word stalking. Um, so, for example, in Britain, there's a national stalking helpline. So if you've, you know, experiencing, you know, unwanted contacts and you think, oh, God, is this stalking? You can literally call a telephone number and talk to someone who knows about it and explain what's happening and they can give you advice about what to do and where to get help. Mm. And, poten- and, like that in yeah, and potentially reaffirm to you as well as a, yes, yeah. you are being victimised. Yes, yeah. this is re- this, right. this recognisable behaviour. We hear it X amount of times a week. Exactly. And, and. 
that's exactly right. That validation of that person's experience and mm. just the kind of sense that you're know, I'm not I'm not going crazy. This is actually something that's happening and it's something I should be. You know, it's genuinely um, something that my response is reasonable. Mm. I mean, there's efforts in Australia to try to start changing that. For example, today actually the day we're doing this interview um, um, is actually you know the first ever. Stalking Awareness Day in Australia. <laughs> um, hmm. So, and that's been promoted by some stalking victims who are who are trying to increase attention and to to generate more attention to stalking and to better responses. And there are similar things that have previously happened in other countries, like in the USA and the UK. They have stalking awareness days and weeks where you can really focus in on attention and police agencies kind of make explicit, you know, um, attempts to help people and recognise and understand stalking, these kinds of things. So we're just at the very beginning of that in Australia, which is which is sad. Mm. Uh, we should be a lot further along, but there hasn't been the will, I think, historically to do mm. that here. And another complicating factor, in some cases, the courts can even be used as a, as a, as a method of, of stalking mm. and, and harassment. Yeah. Yeah, this is something you, you hear about quite a lot. It, it's you hear about it particularly in the context of family violence. So ex partners, you know, using the courts to 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 harass you know their victims. But actually, it's just it's quite common in all stalking cases. It's not an uncommon thing. Mm. So you'll have people um, putting restraining orders out against their stalking victim, mm. so to force the victim to come to court. Um, you'll have them accusing victims of doing things. Um, and it might not just be courts. It could also be like a tribunal, so making complaints about, I don't know, something the victim's done with their work, mm -hmm. you know, that their advertising is illegal, or, you know, making a complaint to a professional registration body, like, for example, about a doctor. Yeah, so you're using kind of these formal institutions like courts or tribunals to do the harassment for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Because those institutions are usually not very good at recognising when they're being used in that way. Um, so there's a really very classic example uh, in, in my field of this, um, and it's publicly well known, so I don't feel problematic talking about it. But um, Madonna, for example, was a very well-known stalking victim in the 1990s. She had a, a stalker who was very, very persistent and very, very worrisome. And when he was arrested, um, he was arrested and he was brought to court. And the court said, you know, you need to come to Madonna. She said, you need to come and testify as a, as a, as a witness. And she said, oh, I'm not going to do that. And the court actually ended up subpoenaing her to come to the court. Mm. And her comment on the stand was, you've just given him exactly what he wants, which mm. is to be in the same room as me. Mm. And that's, that captures it exactly. The court doesn't recognise what's going on. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, that happens, unfortunately, not uncommonly. As we have touched on already... Kobe Langshaw had four previous convictions for oppressive actions towards Patrick Gardner and Aaron Herbert before the guilty findings last week. But they were not the only ones. Between the filing of the charges relating to Mr Gardner and her conviction of them, Langshaw was convicted of six other sets of allegations. Breaches of restraining order, falsehoods to receive bail, common assault, criminal damage and stalking. Some of those were committed in her temporary new base of Kalgoorlie, where she was convicted of stalking a completely different person last August. A man she'd come into contact with, become obsessed with, and then began bombarding him with messages claiming that she was having an affair with his wife. For that, she was given a seven-month jail term. That sentence was handed down during the trial in Perth. And following that sentencing and a story which appeared in the Kalgoorlie Minor, Ms Langshaw later insisted it be taken down because of the risks associated with publishing any story without having all of the material in front of you. It might be the case that there are other stories that I could bring to your attention that would generate a lot more interest than these ones, she wrote. Before she had even heard the verdicts of the magistrate last week, she implored me not to publish what was about to be made public, promising she could provide a much juicier tale. She later insisted in writing that the trial evidence and witnesses had all been tainted. And even back in December 2016, just months after the first restraining order was sought and granted by Mr Gardner, 
Ms Langshaw was writing to reporters, insisting she had recordings about a story that was worthy of 60 minutes. Professor, is it common for those being accused of stalking to be claiming uh, victimhood themselves? Uh, yes, I would suggest from my experience of working with, you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of people who, who've, who've um, been charged and convicted of stalking, I would say, yeah, that's a pretty common presentation. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean they're lying. Sometimes they are victims mm. themselves. But um, in a lot of cases, their perception of what is going on is so skewed um, that they don't see kind of an objective reality, if you like. Uh, it doesn't mean they're delusional or mentally ill necessarily, but they, they get – some people who stalk can get very fixed on one version of events mm. and they kind of can't take into account other information. Uh, and obviously if, if someone has a severe mental illness, like I was discussing before, that obviously is implicated in that as well. So you can, you can have kind of symptoms of mental illness that, that mean people are actually physically less able to, to see reality mm. uh, in some cases. Mm. And what, um, in your sort of research and, and, and work in this um, area, what are the challenges uh, you know, sort of magistrates and courts um, come up against in sort of sentencing um, for, mm. for stalking behaviours? That's a great question. Um, and I, I wouldn't pretend to be a judicial officer, so <laughs> I, I'll just preface all this by saying I'm not having to make these decisions. Um, I would say from my perception, the challenges are often that it's very difficult to um, give sentences that allow for appropriate intervention with the person stalking. Mm. So in most places, so I'll give an example. If you've got someone who's engaged in, in an act of violence, right, and the magistrate wants that person to have some psychological treatment or some help for that for that violence, you know, it's there are within the correctional services in Australia, in every correctional service, there will be psychological treatment programs, for example, for violence. Right. So if they sit, put a person on a sentence, they say either I'm going to send you to prison or perhaps they might sentence them in the community. As part of that sentence, you will participate in this program. Right. That doesn't exist for stalking. There's nothing. Mm. Okay. And so the availability of specialist services is just, except for in Victoria, where there's a small there's a small public service that does this, um, that doesn't exist. So even if the magistrate recognises that the person needs intervention and needs needs assistance to stop stalking, in many places there's nothing that they can order. Secondly, if most people who stalk don't end up in court with a stalking charge, right? They end up in court with a much less serious charge. And so that puts limitations on what the court can do in terms of the sentence. So they can't perhaps sentence them to a long period of supervision, yeah, which is what you would need to actually engage that person mm. in, in intervention. Yeah, They can only give like a six-month sentence. Nothing's going to happen in six months. <laughs> so there's there's uh, it's, it's a really complicated kind of picture and question and it's got challenges that come from systemic issues mm. from failure to recognize stalking and from the way that um, criminal justice systems respond to people who offend and 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 how you have to engage with those people and give them help help them have services to, to help them not reoffend again mm. so that it, it's got like lots of moving parts that probably a little bit too complicated to answer in great depth <laughs> here um, but but it, uh, you're right in saying there are challenges because there are challenges and they're very significant yeah. and you know, finally, you've dedicated thousands of hours of your mind and you know your body of work to the to the stalker and their motivations and and prospects. And that four hundred thousand number shows it is a massive issue in this country. So, you know, in in your view, what you know, what should we or society try to be doing to reduce that number or at, yeah. at least sort of make it um, so that number could be reduced in the future? Yeah, I think there are. I would say probably. Well, there's many things, but let's let's pick the top three. Mm. Um, I'll say um, at the biggest, broadest level, we've already talked about it, but the idea of awareness, helping people be aware of what stalking is, mm -hmm. both people who might start stalking and be able to go, oh, hang on, I'm doing this. This is actually a problem. It's not just a few phone calls. It's actually a problem. So awareness in general in the community, just as the first line preventative measure, hey, this is what stalking is, you know, 
when this happens, this is a problem. We need to do something about it. So that's my first kind of level. The second thing I would say is that for victims who are stalked, we need to be better at providing support and resources and information. We need to have um, just, you know, through victims of crime, but also, you know, through specific um, information that's called stalking, like a website or something like that, sponsored mm. by government that says this is, here's all the information, here's one place you can go, and if you need it, here's someone you can call to talk about this and to be directed to help. And then at the next layer down, for people who stalk, we need to have better services to support those people and help them not do it, not continue to do it and not do it again. Mm. Ideally, in a perfect world, every, everyone would stop when they are told to. We know that doesn't happen. We know that fully half of people who are arrested for stalking continue to stalk. You know, we know that a third of people nearly who are convicted of stalking in a court continue to stalk. Yeah, our criminal justice response by itself is not going to solve this problem. So we need to have additional attention to providing services that can work with people who are stalking to not do it. Mm. And by doing that, we are helping victims and we are helping the community to not be harmed. Yeah. Professor Troy McEwen, thanks so much for uh, sparing your time and expertise for us on Court in the Act this week. No worries. Thanks so much, Tim. I really appreciate the time. Mm -hmm. And a postscript to this story. As I walked into court last week, I didn't know what Kobe Langshaw looked like, but she evidently recognised me. She addressed me as Mr Clark as I took my seat in the public gallery. And then when she came to plead for her non-publication case, she mentioned she had been in touch with me before. It was not a message I remembered, but when I looked back into my social media archives, there it was. A message from law clerk Jane Langshaw on my LinkedIn page. From October 2020. Mr Clark, do you happen to be around the city anytime next week for a quick chat? I had only replied with a thumbs up emoji. I am now quite relieved I didn't respond with anything else. Thanks to you all for joining us again. Please don't hesitate to get in touch with us by writing to Court in the Act at wanews.com.au. Don't forget to like and subscribe and tell all your friends and family and colleagues all about us. And remember, if you want to know what's going on in court, don't get caught short. Get caught in the act instead. See you next week. 